Good evening. Um, on behalf of the ULCC Library Committee and Literary Subcommittee, welcome to tonight's program, Hidden Chicago Landmarks with John R. Schmidt. I would like to extend a special welcome to our Caxton Club friends who are attending this program. A huge thank you to Caxton Club President Jackie Vosler for collaborating with us for this and upcoming virtual programming. By working together, we can extend our reach and bring you more and varied programming. We truly are better together. So thank you, Caxton Club. A few things before we get started. John would be happy to answer questions. So please put them in the Q&A anytime during the program and they will be addressed after his presentation. We encourage you to support Chicago's struggling independent bookstores. John's book, this is what it looks like, is available at the bookseller in Lincoln Square. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, John Schmidt, a fifth generation Chicagoan and storyteller. John is a valued ULCC Library Committee and Archives Subcommittee member. He is also a professional historian and earned a PhD in history at the University of Chicago. John has written approximately 500 articles in various publications and published five books. Please look for his new book coming out on April 26th called Unknown Chicago Tales. So I'm now going to step back and turn my camera off and turn the program over to John for a look at Chicago's hidden landmarks. Take it away, John. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And to begin with, I'd like to thank Cheryl Ziegler and of course, Josh Stell for putting this Zoom uh, program together. I've uh, done regular presentations before live presentations, radio presentations, but this first time I was on Zoom as a presenter and uh, well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> anyway. This is the cover of the book. The book is called Hidden Chicago Landmarks, and they are the things that aren't on the usual tour. Uh, there are 42 current landmarks in all, 14 from the north uh, side of the city suburbs, 14 from the south, uh, 14 for the central west. Uh, there are also 10 lost landmarks that uh, are things that should have been preserved but weren't. And then we finally have um, Chicago's version of uh, flyover country. I, I call these drive-by neighborhoods. Uh, they're the neighborhoods that may be interesting, uh, but most people just drive by them on their way someplace else. Well, they cover the book. And uh, you could say I started writing this book in 1978. And that's when I bought my first house. Uh, it was in Oak Park near Harlem and Roosevelt. It was the uh, unfashionable side of Oak Park, uh, and that's all I could afford then. But uh, down the block from me, there was this magnificent house uh, just stood out in the neighborhood. And uh, after I'd been there for a few months, uh, I finally found out uh, that this house had a singular historical notoriety, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's go to a little bit more familiar Chicago landmark. This is the Biograph Theater on Lincoln Avenue. This isn't in the book, by the way, but this is an introduction to the first uh, thing I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the Biograph Theater, of course, is uh, famous today in a gangster tours, particularly because this is where John Dillinger met his end in 1934. John Dillinger was a um, well, bad boy folk hero then. He was America's bank robber. And um, he was shot coming out of the theater in 1934 by the feds. and uh, he was so uh, popular with the general, uh, at least the, uh, some segment of the general public that after they took Billinger's body away, there were people in the alley sopping up his blood in handkerchiefs. Well, that was John Dillinger. Now, this next picture, a few miles away from the biograph is at 2040 West Potomac Avenue near uh, Division and, uh, and Damon. And it's the site of the greatest Chicago manhunt since Dillinger. And this is uh, where the police captured Richard Carpenter in 1955. Now, Richard Carpenter was a small time punk. 
uh, in the summer of 1955, he'd been a suspect in um, about a hundred small time uh, robberies in Chicago, small time stuff, isolated pedestrians, uh, uh, grocery stores, things of that sort. Uh, well, in August, a policeman recognized Carpenter on a subway train. A policeman uh, arrested him, but uh, Carpenter uh, managed to get a gun out, shot the policeman dead, and he escaped up the subway steps. Well, then the manhunt started. The Chicago police, one of their own, had been killed. And the search went out for Carpenter all over the city. Where was Carpenter? And this was the early days of TV. And um, TV stations started giving bulletins every, every half hour in the hunt for cop killer Carpenter. And in those days, he became uh, a bogeyman for the, for the kids of the city of Chicago uh, because uh, this publicity was on the TV screens and parents would use him as a bogeyman to threaten their reluctant kids. You know, kid would they'd tell the kid, uh, I don't care if you want to stay out 10 minutes longer, you get inside now or Carpenter's going to get you. Well, a few days after Carpenter shot this policeman, another policeman uh, recognized him. He, Carpenter sleeping in a theater, Biltmore Theater on Division Street. And um, policeman woke up Carpenter and Carpenter pretended to go along, but then he pulled out a gun. There was another shootout in the theater and Carpenter escaped. And so the manhunt went on. What, what had happened to Carpenter? Well, Carpenter had managed to uh, get away from the theater, but, but he had been shot and he limped over to that two flat at 2040 West Potomac Avenue. And uh, he broke in and he held a truck driver and his, his family hostage for 24 hours. People were still looking for the city. Where's Carpenter? And finally, though, the Carpenter let his guard down. Truck driver got out, family got out, and they called the police. And then the police arrived, and the TV crews arrived, and a helicopter came overhead. And uh, people gathered on the street, and there's searchlights, and the bullhorn blared, Carpenter, come out with your hands up. Well, Carpenter tried to get away again. He tried to leap through to another apartment window. There are more gunshots. And this time, though, the police got their man. And if Carpenter thought he was going to be a bad boy, folk hero like Dillinger, it, it didn't work out that way. When, they, when he was being led away by the cops, the people on the street started yelling, kill him, kill him. And um, in 1958, Richard Carpenter died in the electric chair. Well, this next photo might be a little more familiar. This is a scene from the 1968 Democratic National Convention. And this is in Grant Park. And you see all those people gathered around in this hill around this statue here. And they were protesters. Uh, it was a convenient place for the protesters to marshal during the convention because the Democratic National Party, uh, the Democrats had their headquarters across the street at the Hilton. So these protesters are out there. Famous picture this became. Well, the man on this statue is General John Logan. And you may have not wondered, I didn't wonder at the time, but what's this hill doing in Grant Park? Why is this statue on a hill? And that goes into the story of General John Logan. John Logan was from Illinois. He was a Civil War general, became a hero in the Civil War. He got into Republican politics after the war, became a US Senator. He was the one who uh, led the sponsorship that eventually established Memorial Day as a national holiday. And in 1884, John Logan, US Senator from Illinois, was the vice presidential nominee on the Republican ticket. Ran with uh, James G. Blaine. Well, Republicans lost that year to Grover Cleveland in Chet Arthur. But Logan was then considered the front runner for the next nomination in 1888. But then Logan did the worst possible thing for his political career. He died in 1886. And now we get to that hill in Grand Park, which is what it looks like today without all the people gathered around. You see, this also gets into this New York Chicago rivalry because in 1885, the year before Logan died, Ulysses S. Grant had died. Now, Grant, of course, was the famous Union general of the Civil War, and he'd also been president. When Grant had been a 
resident of Illinois. He uh, lived in Galena, but he happened to die in New York State. And so now in 1886, New York City was building a magnificent tomb for General Grant, who was going to be on the west side of Manhattan. Well, in Chicago, they were thinking, those body snatchers in, the, in New York City have pulled a fast one on us. But we've got our own hero here in Chicago and in Illinois. We've got General Logan. And if they're going to build a tomb for Grant in New York City, we in Chicago are going to build an even more magnificent tomb for General Logan. And so the park, uh, park district, park commissioners got involved. They spent a ton of money, built that hill up there in Grant Park, which was going to uh, hold the general's mausoleum. They commissioned a statue from the greatest sculptor in America, Augustus St. Gaudens. And they put this heroic statue of uh, General Logan on the top of this prospective tomb. And Mrs. Logan at first uh, liked the idea she was going to go around along with it. But then after a couple of years, she kind of hemmed and hawed and she kind of decided, well, she kind of liked it in Washington, D.C. She would made a career in Washington, D.C. And she would just as soon stay in Washington and keep the general there. So um, Logan never did make it to Chicago. And uh, that hill is still there in Grant Park. And that statue is still there. And that's also, I suppose, it, Answer to a trivia question, uh, who is buried in Logan's tomb? At least in Chicago, the answer is nobody. Well, here we have the Eisenhower Bridge by the old post office over the Chicago River. And today, the um, interchange that they're working on, the old Chicago Circle interchange, which they're still working on, is known, was renamed after Mayor Jane Byrne. And that usage has come into common usage today. They call it the Byrne Circle. But uh, most people probably don't know that this bridge over here, over the Chicago River, was named the Clarence Wagner Memorial Bridge. And that name has been there officially since 1953. Well, now, who was Clarence Wagner? Best picture I could come up with him. Anyway, Clarence Wagner in 1953 was 14th Ward, 14th Ward Democratic Committeeman. He was an alderman and head of the Finance Committee, uh, the mayor. Mayor Kennelly was a weak mayor. Uh, Wagner practically ran the city. Well, anyway, in 1953, the Democrats had decided they had to get rid of Mayor Kennelly. And there was going to be a meeting of the Cook County Central Committee and the uh, new head of the Central Committee, they were going to elect the new head of the Cook County Central Democratic Committee. Uh, they were going to elect the city, uh, the county clerk, Richard J. Daly. And he was going to become the head of the local party. And then two years later, he would run for mayor and he'd be elected. And everything looked like it was cut and dry. And it was even mentioned in the newspapers as what was going to happen. But then at the meeting, uh, Clarence Wagner stood up and he asked for a delay. And uh, he was a popular man among the other Democrats, so they gave him this two-week delay. And uh, that would give him time to do some political maneuvering. Uh, he'd probably decided he was just as good a man to be mayor as Daley was. So uh, they'd have a couple weeks to maneuver things. Well, anyway, during these two weeks, uh, Wagner decided to take a little vacation. And he and another politician and their young sons decided to go up to Minnesota and do a little fishing. Well, they drove up to Minnesota and then Clarence Wagner did the worst possible thing for his political career. He ran his car off the road and he was killed in the accident. The other, the car with him survived with minor injuries, but Clarence Wagner was killed. And um, then of course, uh, the meeting was held. Democrats um, named Daley, the head of the local party. Two years later, he ran for mayor. He became mayor. And of course, Richard J. Daley, I was eventually followed by Richard M. Daley, was also elected mayor. And that started the Daley dynasty. But interesting thing about Clarence Wagner's death, his death also started another political dynasty because when he was killed, the man who succeeded him as 14th Ward Alderman was a man by the name of Joseph Burke. And some years later, when Joseph Burke died, his son, Joe Burke's son, became the new alderman and committeeman. And that son 
was Edward Burke, Ed Burke. And of course, Ed Burke has become the longest serving alderman in Chicago history. So Clarence Wagner's death really uh, started two political dynasties going in Chicago. Well, uh, as I said, the um, bridge, um, his not, name has not come into common usage uh, for many years. There wasn't even a plaque on it, but then in 2013, 60th anniversary of Clarence Wagner's death, Alderman Burke came out and they dedicated a plaque and it's on the Southeast Bridge House if anybody's looking for it. But that name, Clarence Wagner Memorial Bridge, has not come into common usage. And uh, I think that's probably just as well because uh, why would you name an expressway bridge after someone was killed in an auto accident? Well, let's get back to the mystery house. 1147 South Winona Avenue in Oak Park, down the block from where I lived 1178. And this is, as I found out some months after I moved in, this was the home of this man, Sam Giancana, my boss in Chicago. Born on the west side in 1908, worked, his, uh, worked for the Capone mob, moved his way up in the uh, Chicago outfit, and he bought that house in Oak Park, 1945. And by the 1960s, Giancana was the public face of the Chicago outfit. But the thing was, Sam loved publicity and organized crime, prefers, prefers to operate under the radar wherever they could. So he was kind of forced out of power he went to live in Mexico for a while, but he kept that house in Oak Park. And in 1975, he was back in Oak Park and he was being called to testify before a Senate committee. And uh, one day in the summer, he's down in the basement frying some sausage in, uh, on, a, on a stove in the basement. And uh, somebody who he trusted uh, shot him in the back and killed him. And that was the end of Sam Giancana. Well, as I said, when I moved in, I didn't know this was Giancana's house. I remembered the shooting, of course, it had only been a couple, three years earlier. And uh, I talked to my neighbors about Sam Giancana and they said, well, yeah, uh, Sam didn't bother the neighbors and <laughs> the neighbors sure didn't bother him. But uh, the one thing though, my neighbors said about him was they missed the FBI men who used to keep Sam Giancana's house under surveillance because the neighbors said, having those FBI men around 24 seven, it sure made the neighborhood feel safer. Well, here's a plug. This is one of my earlier books. This one's called On This Day in Chicago History and the title describes it. 366 uh, stories Chicago, one for each day of the year. Well, when I was researching this book, um, I already, I'm going to work with the date of September 11th. And of course, I already knew what happened on September 11, 2001. But instead of going into Chicago's um, reaction to the uh, terrorist attacks on that day, I decided to look up in the newspapers what had been the big news story exactly 100 years later. What was the big news story in Chicago, September 11th, 1901? And oddly enough, I found out that on that day, the news in Chicago was that the most notorious terrorist in America had been captured right here in the city of Chicago. Well, the alleged terrorist was Emma Goldman and she was supposed to be involved in a conspiracy to kill the president of the United States. Well, Emma Goldman, had been radicalized by um, the unjust uh, hangings of the Haymarket defendants. And by 1901, she was very well known as a left-wing activist. And uh, on September 6th, President William McKinley had been shot in Buffalo and the shooter was captured and they asked the shooter about his motive. And he said, I'm an anarchist and I'd been inspired uh, to my, uh, my task here by Emma Goldman. I met Emma Goldman, heard, heard her speak. Well. Authorities began rounding up Goldman's associates. Uh, they were looking for Goldman. They didn't know where she was at first. And then they finally traced her to Chicago. They traced her to an apartment on Sheffield Avenue. 
And on September 10th, the police moved in and they arrested Goldman and she came along quietly. She denied being part of any conspiracy. Uh, she decided she would use her arrest to get her views before the public. And she even posed for this uh, picture over here, which ran in Chicago Tribune. She said, well, that way, the next time the police want to arrest me, they'll, they'll have an easier time of it. Well, anyway, um, no evidence was found Lincoln. Emma Goldman or any of his, her associates to McKinley's killing and she was released. Uh, she was later exiled in the Red Scare of 1919, but after she died in Canada, her remains were brought back to Illinois and she's buried in one of the Western suburbs. And this is the place uh, where Goldman was captured in Chicago on Sheffield. Uh, an interesting thing, in 2014, the Canadian TV series, The Murdoch Mysteries, ran an episode on the shooting of McKinley and the capture of Emma Goldman. And for dramatic purposes, since this is a Canadian series, they moved her capture to Toronto. Well, I love the Murdoch Mysteries. It's one of my favorite TV shows and the episode was very well done. But if you wanna see where it really happened, you go to 2126 North Sheffield which is where Emma Goldman was captured. What is this? It looks like a scrapyard. Well, it is a scrapyard. It's at 9331 South Ewing Avenue. It's also the home of the smallest cemetery in Chicago. The cemetery has one permanent resident, Andreas Von Zerngable. Well, Andreas was born in 1797. He was somewhere in Europe. We're not exactly sure where. And by 1815, he was in the Prussian army. He fought in the Battle of Waterloo, which defeated Napoleon. But Andreas came out of the battle with only one arm. And after that, he became a fisherman, which was kind of a difficult thing to do in the 19th century with only one arm. But anyway, Andrew. Andrews persisted. He got married, raised a family, came to the United States, and eventually, in 1854, he settled in Chicago. Uh, bought a plot of land south of the city by the mouth of the Calumet River, and then he went on with his fishing. And then in 1855, a year after he bought this land, Andrews died. Well, his family laid him to rest on his property. They put a white uh, across their white grave marker, little white picket fence around it, and then family dispersed, but every year or periodically they'd come back and they tend to the grave. Well, time went by. And during the 1880s, a canal company laid claim to this land. Uh, they said that Andrews had just been a squatter, that he never bought the land really. And the family said, no, no, they had a deed, but the, the deed was lost in the Chicago fire. So litigation ensued case eventually went to the Illinois Supreme Court and the Illinois Supreme Court ruled that uh, the canal company owned the land. However, uh, the court also recognized that Andreas's family had taken good care of the grave and the court ruled that Andreas could stay where he was. So years went by and that uh, white picket fence uh, would get knocked over, people uh, going through there on their everyday business, uh, running a scrapyard, uh, uh, would, would not be as careful as they might have been. So eventually, the, uh, a local historical society and uh, this, a Von Zergenova family uh, kicked in some money and they restored the grave here. They put up those. Uh, granite blocks around it, and they put a nice grave marker over Andrus. Uh, if you look at the grave marker, you notice you might notice they get the wrong year for the Battle of uh, Waterloo. It's actually 1815, but anyway, they did re uh, remember Andrus, and um, that grave is still there. He's still uh, in the scrapyard. Um, it's not open to the public. Uh, people were very nice uh, at the scrapyard when I explained what I was doing. They they let me come in and take pictures, but um, I will tell you that 
access is limited to this grave yard, to this uh, cemetery, unless you're one of Andrew's descendants. This is some funny, at least a funny picture. This is from the 1935 Marx Brothers classic, A Night at the Opera. And in this scene, uh, Groucho has uh, tried to smuggle uh, Chico and Harpo and the uh, juvenile uh, singing lead into the United States. And he has them disguised as three heroic Italian flyers. And this is the scene from the movie. Well, anybody in 1935 knew immediately that this was a spoof on the Belbo Squadron. Now, who was Belbo and what was his squadron? Well, this is Belbo, General Italo Belbo. He was the head of the Italian Air Force in 1834. And with the World's Fair in Chicago, he led a contingent of 24 seaplanes to Chicago. And they flew across the Atlantic, came to Chicago. The seaplanes landed in Lake Michigan. And uh, for the next several days, Chicago went Belbo crazy. Uh, there were parades, there were banquets, radio broadcast. Uh, 7th Street was renamed Balbo Drive. And uh, then Balbo and the Italian Flyers went back home to Italy. Well, the next year, to commemorate the one year anniversary of the Balbo Squadron, the government of Italy gifted a 2000 year old temple column to Chicago. And it became known as the Balbo Column. And it was put in place in the park just east of Soldier Field. And there it is. Well, that Temple Com has become one of the most controversial monuments in the city of Chicago, perhaps the most controversial, because the Italian government that gifted that monument to Chicago was the fascist government of Benito Mussolini. And Belbo himself was a committed fascist. And what even makes matters worse is the inscription on the monument, it's in Italian. And it talks about uh, the fact that this was given by Benito Mussolini and it was given in the 12th year of the fascist era. So there are a lot of calls to remove the monument. Well, let's step back a little bit. This is a 2000 year old monument and it didn't have anything to do with fascism. So probably the simplest thing to do would be to leave the monument in place and just put a plaque over that fascist business. It's in a section of uh, the park that's called the Gold Star Mothers Park. So dedicated to a good cause, dedicated to the Gold Star Mothers. But uh, keep the column there. The supposed cause of the Chicago fire, it says, Mrs. O'Leary and her cow. We all know that story. Whether it's true or not, we all know the story. Well, what would you do if your mother had destroyed Chicago? That was the problem that little Jimmy O'Leary had. He was two years old when the Great Fire of 1871 started, supposedly in the barn behind the house on the Coven Street. And his mother was vilified for somehow being the cause of this fire. You know, what would you do if? You were little Jimmy O'Leary then. Well, if you were little Jimmy O'Leary, you'd grow up to be Big Jim O'Leary, the gambling king of the stockyards. Well, 1892, Big Jim first got his first big stake in becoming a gambler. It was a heavyweight boxing bout in New Orleans that year. John L. Sullivan, was fighting James J. Corbett. And everybody figured Sullivan has to win. He was unbeatable. But Big Jim O'Leary thought, mm, maybe not. And he got long odds on Corbett. Four to one, five to one, 10 to one. He bet his whole bankroll on Corbett. And when Corbett won, Big Jim had his bankroll. And he soon came back to Chicago he opened what they called a resort at uh, 41st in Halsted. 
opposite the stockyards. And in this resort, they had a bar, they had, a bar, they had a, a restaurant, they had a massage parlor, bowling alley, billiard rooms, but everybody knew in the back room, you could get a bet down at, Jim, big, at big Jim's place. So uh, he prospered and he was a visionary too. Long before they had suburban shopping malls, he opened up a branch in suburban DuPage County. He even had a, a gambler special trains that ran out there. For a while, he had a gambling boat on Lake Michigan. Uh, and he did very well for himself. And before every election, uh, he became known as a prognosticator. The, the newspapers would come out, they asked Big Jim, who's going to win the election? And he'd go through a whole ceremony and he'd say, well, this candidate is going to win. Uh, Carter Harrison's going to win the election. And he called the winner right often enough so that his uh, reputation was preserved. Well, fun times lasted for years. But then in 1920, Prohibition came, and uh, the feds did not uh, take, uh, the feds were harder to deal with than Chicago politicians, let's put it that way. And uh, Big Jim was raided a number of times. He said uh, that uh, after a while, he told his friends in newspapers, well, maybe I should retire. Uh, after all, I got enough money, I'm a millionaire many times over, but. When he did die in 1925, they found he only had $10,000 in the bank. Uh, like any gambler, he knew he should keep up a good front. But uh, when Big Jim was alive, even though his um, resort and all his other uh, landmarks of his career were gone, uh, this house that he built, this mansion that he built is still there. This is at um, on, on Garfield Boulevard, 726 West Garfield Boulevard. Uh, was then a fashionable neighborhood in 1901 when he built it. And Big Jim's mansion is still there. And if you can look in the picture, I look in one of the windows over there, there's a ladder that looks like it's being renovated. So this is Big Jim O'Leary. Another strange landmark. This is a Hyatt Centric Hotel, downtown Chicago, a couple blocks from Union League Hub. And uh, our concern is with that little door off to the left at the main entrance. You see the two men talking there, just to the left of those two men, there's a little door open over there. Well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. We'll go back into the history of this place because um, back in 1833, when Chicago was just getting started, a um, man by the name of Willard Jones bought a plot of land from the state of Illinois, 90 foot wide at the Northwest corner of Monroe and Clark. And he kept it for a while. And then after a while, he sold off the southern portion of the land. But when he sold off the southern portion of the land, he kept uh, access to a 10 foot wide strip on the southern portion of the land. And the reason he kept that access to that strip was so he could lead his cows down to pasture. And the pasture in those days was where the Board of Trade is today. Well, anyway, many years go by and I describe it all in the book, but anyway, by the 1920s, uh, they were gonna build a building on this uh, site. And uh, it turned out that the people on the north part of the property, the property to the north, figured they, they looked at their old deed and they still had the access to this 10 foot strip. So they uh, started to put the squeeze on the people who wanted to put up the building on the south part of the property saying, hey, you know, you're gonna have to pay us off for this uh, strip of land over here. Well, the people were building the building, they redrew their architectural plans and they said, well, the heck with you we'll just give you access through the Western part of our property. And they built the building and they left this access there. And believe it or not, this is the original Chicago cow path. And this is open to the public. You go through that door you walk through there along the side, actually under the side of buildings, it's like an arcade almost. And it uh, hitches up with another alley, you turn left and then you take you out to LaSalle Street. And uh, this was fam famous for many years. Uh, they even put a plaque on it in the 1930s, but the plaque disappeared. And uh, it was kind of forgotten for many years, but uh, I'm happy to be able to tell the story again. And I'm also happy that the people that uh, opened the hotel have a sense of whimsy themselves because one of their meeting rooms is named after Willard Jones, the original owner of the property, the original man who built the compound. Now, this is Herbie Haupt. He was born in Germany in 1919, came to Chicago as a boy, became an American citizen. Uh, Lane Tech was in ROTC. 
So what's this nice looking young man doing with an FBI bug shot on? Well, in 1942, he was arrested in Chicago as a Nazi saboteur. Well, Herbie lived in this house here on Fremont Street with his parents at 2234 North Fremont. And in 1941, uh, he had been traveling in Asia, and uh, he was there when the United States and Germany went to war. Well, he wound up back in Germany, and the Germans still considered him a German citizen. And uh, he finally uh, be, was recruited into this uh, group of saboteurs who uh, were Germans who knew American customs and could blend in, and they were landed in the United States in a submarine. And their, their idea, their, their mission was to go around and blow up munition plants and so on, do sabotage. Well, um, when the saboteurs landed in the States, uh, two of them immediately gave up. They went to the FBI. The FBI was notified and they busted Herbie out. And um, Herbie was arrested when he was in uh, June of 1942 when he was driving away from the house in his new Pontiac. And um, it was wartime. Uh, President Roosevelt decreed that uh, Herbie, even though he was an American citizen, should be put on trial in a military tribunal. And he was put on trial, he was found guilty. Case went to the Supreme Court, his American citizen being put on trial uh, without uh, on a military tribunal, but uh, the Supreme Court said, no, he's an unlawful combatant. So August 8th that year, US citizen Herbie Haupt died in the electric chair. And as I said, this is the house the apartment on 2242 Fremont where he spent his last hours of freedom. This is Charles Gates Dawes. Now, if you're from Evanston, you probably know who Dawes is. So you take a few minutes to go get a drink of water or something, but I'll tell the rest of the people about Dawes. Uh, what's he doing here is he smoke, first of all, he's smoking what's called a Dawes pipe. He designed that pipe himself. It looks like the letter P. But that's not what he's famous for. He was famous for becoming vice president of the United States. And he became vice president of the United States in 1924 uh, when he was Coolidge's running mate. And um, a year later, in 1925, Dawes won the Nobel Peace Prize. And he'd won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his work sorting out German reparations. Uh, World War I had ended a few years earlier and the Germans had to pay reparations to the victorious allies. Dawes came up with a plan where they could um, pay the reparations in an easier manner. So he got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. Um, 1928 came, Coolidge decided not to run again. Uh, Dawes was not really seriously considered for becoming the presidential nominee. That went to Herbert Hoover, who won. And Dawes retired back to Evanston, to this house, which is on uh, Greenwood in Evanston. And Dawes lived there until he died in 1951. Well, today the house is a museum and you can visit it. And um, this was a home of a person from uh, suburban Chicago, who was the vice president, who won the Nobel Peace Prize. And something that some people don't know, uh, Dawes also was a music composer. And some years after his death, during the 1950s, um, a singer, record producer, adopted one of these melodies that Dawes had written. And it was recorded. And the recording of the song eventually made it to number one on the Billboard chart. And the song was uh, sung by Tommy M. Edwards, and it's called It's All in the Game. And if you want to listen to it, I haven't got the record here. You can find it on YouTube. So it's called It's All in the Game by Tommy Edwards. And this was Charles Gates Dawes, vice president, Nobel Prize winner, and pop composer. Well, Republican politician, how about a Democratic politician? We'll be fair and balanced. Uh, uh, here we have a graduation photo for the Maine South uh, High School yearbook in Park Ridge, where my kids went to school, by the way. This is Hillary Rodham, class of 1965. 
And of course, she later becomes famous as Hillary Rodham Clinton, First Lady, U.S. Senator, Secretary of State, presidential candidate. This is the house where um, Hillary grew up in Park Ridge. It's on North Wisner Street, and it's been given official recognition by the city of Park Ridge. There is a uh, sign on one of the on the street sign calls it Rodham Corner. Um, lesser known uh, place in her life, by the way, that you might want to check out if you're interested, is the house where she uh, originally lived in an Edgewater neighborhood. She'd moved in this house with her family when she was three, but for the first three years of her life, she lived in an apartment building in Edgewater at 5722 North Winthrop in Chicago. And um, one final thing, if you're in Park Ridge and you're looking for another historic house, you can check out this one a few blocks away. This is 109 West, pardon me, 109 North Washington Avenue. Uh, this is where Harrison Ford grew up. Well, here's another movie reference. A Christmas Story, and we all got finished watching this uh, story of Ralphie Parker who was looking for the sled in 1940. Well, the story comes from Gene Shepard, and he wrote short stories. He made a career on radio and TV. If you're not familiar with Gen Gene Shepard, uh, you think him of think of him as an earlier uh, Hammond version of Garrison Keillor. And uh, Gene does have a cameo in the movie on the scene where Ralphie wants to go see Santa. While Gene Shepard's in the movie, he's got a beard on and he's a father staying with his son. He said, little boy, go to the end of the line. That's, that's Gene Shepard with his cameo. Well, anyway, this is the home where Gene Shepard grew up and uh, where he lived out the adventures of a Christmas story. Now this one is a private residence and the people there do not welcome visitors, but you can drive by and take a picture like I did. The house that was used in the movie is actually in Cleveland. And uh, if you go to that house in Cleveland, it's open as a museum and across the street from that place, there's a souvenir shop that sells uh, funny play suits. And uh, you can even get an electric, electric sex leg lamp there. But if you go to Hammond, don't bother people in this house. Joe Lewis, he was a heavyweight boxing champ from 1937 to 1949. He's born in Alabama. He grew up in Detroit. He spent his last years as a greeter in a Las Vegas casino. But while he was a champ, he lived in Chicago. For a while, he lived in the Rosenwald Apartments of 47th of Michigan, where a lot of the um, famous African-Americans African of that day lived. But by 1937, he and his wife Marva owned this apartment building at 4320 South Michigan Avenue. And he even mentions in his autobiography how he'd come back there after he won the title at Comiskey Park and he, he and Marva had to come out and wave at all the people because they'd just gathered in the street cheering for him. Well, when I took this photo for the book, um, one of the tenants happened to come out he asked me what I was doing. And I told him, well, you know, Joe Lewis lived in this building. He owned the building, as a matter of fact. Well, the guy didn't, you know, he knew who Joe Lewis was, but he had no idea that Joe Lewis had once owned the building. So uh, maybe the city would put up a historic marker, 4320 South Michigan Avenue. Uh, this is a historic site. I'm getting running out of time, I, I see, so we'll just do this a little quickly. This is a um, building is still there, 3535 West Roosevelt Road. Uh, this uh, is a church today, but it's a historic landmark. This was the first movie palace. It was called the Central Park Theater. It was opened in 1917 by the Belbins. And the big thing about the Central Park Theater is first of all, it had 1,780 seats. Before then, theaters have been, you know, you know, a, a bed sheet for a screen and a few folding chairs. This thing was a palace. And it also had air conditioning and people would come in in the morning and spend time there and spend the whole day just cooling off during the summer. Well, building, as I said, is in disrepair. Uh, last I saw was a church and it's still there as far as I know. Ah, another movie scene, Kevin Costner, The Untouchables. This is the scene where the Capone mob is threatening uh, Elliot Ness, so he's got to get his family out. And in the background, lit up by uh, spotlights there, is St. Paul Catholic Church. 
And uh, that short states from 1899, it's at 22nd place uh, near Damon. And it's called the house that was built without a nail because supposedly uh, they supposedly it was built without a nail using original uh, construction methods, but uh, who knows whether it was. Anyway, the church is still there. It's worth taking a look at. Wonderful church. This one, people in the south side don't know this. If you're in the north side, you know this. This is a Leaning Tower YMCA. It was uh, built to uh, disguise a water tank that a man named Robert Ilg had opened a park for his employees at his uh, electric ventilating company. And uh, it's a half scale model of the Leaning Tower in Pisa. It was built with the tilt. It's still there. And uh, of course, now it's owned by the Village of Niles and next door to it's the Leaning Tower YMCA. This is an um, abandoned house in Englewood, 61st place in Normal Boulevard in Englewood. Charles uh, Deneen was a US Senator. He lived here in 1928. The primaries got very heated. Bomb exploded on its front porch. That caused a national sensation. I mean, when Capone and uh, Moran were shooting at each other, that was no big deal, but you didn't bomb a home of the US Senators. And there were calls for President Coolidge to put Chicago into martial law, but it didn't turn out that way. Deneen lived there for many years. He died. As you can see now, the house uh, has fallen in disrepute, but it's still there, 61st place in normal. Uh, this is our cover. This is one of the lost landmarks, Peter Hand Brewing Company. This was at the Northwest corner, Sheffield and North Avenue, Chicago's last macro brewery. They brewed Meisterbrow for many years, Meisterbrow Light. For a while after the brewery was sold, uh, new owners came in, they brewed Old Chicago, which was pretty good beer, but they couldn't compete. So they went out of business and now it's a strip mall. This one, 80, this one is on 57th Street, 832 East 57th Street. This was Ronald Reagan's home when he was a little boy. He lived in Chicago for about a year uh, when he became president. He didn't remember where he had lived, but a friend of his looked, looked through all the old um, police, all the old records of the city. They finally found uh, Ronald Reagan's father, Jack Reagan, and a drunken disorderly uh, charge and it was listed at this address. Well, uh, there were attempts to uh, preserve this as a historic site, but it was eventually torn down and now it's a parking lot. There's another presidential historic site. Jimmy Carter came to Chicago, 1986, as part of Habitat for Humanity. They built uh, this townhouse on the west side of Maypole and Kildare. Uh, the townhouse eventually became derelict and uh, shortly after I took this picture, it was torn down. So this is gone. Finally, to close, quick preview of the next book. This is Bessie Coleman uh, from, she's gonna be an Unknown Chicago Tales. Uh, one of the stories is about her. She was a pioneer aviator who overcame two twin obstacles in the 1920s. The obstacles were being a woman and being black. And this is Tommy O'Connor. He's in the book too, he's spectacular escape. Uh, was dramatizing the play to front page and, and then the movie variations like uh, His Girl Friday and so on. Uh, but now if you want to learn about the bizarre aftermath that went on for 50 years, get the book. Had to put a bowling story in. This is about the bowling ball that went around the world. And finally in the book, one of the stories, this is Sherlock Holmes' and nemesis. This is the real Professor Moriarty. And though Sherlock Holmes never came to Chicago, the real Moriarty did have an adventure here. And that's in the book too. And uh, I'll take any questions now. Cheryl, you're muted. I'm muted. You would think I would have the hang of this by now, but apparently not. Okay. <laughs> so, so we have a couple of questions. Um, Bob Joint asks, when you start your research, do you start with the individual event and then connect the real estate to them? Uh, yeah, usually I do that nowadays, uh, particularly when I was writing that book on this day in Chicago history. And you could find a lot of things in the old newspapers because in those days, the, uh, in the newspapers, they just put everybody's address in the newspaper with them. No idea, of the, the modern idea of privacy or something like that. It, it sells right in the newspaper where Joe Lewis lived, the 4320 South Michigan Avenue. If he was, live, if he was around today, a the celebrity, they wouldn't print his address in the newspaper. So you can find a lot of that stuff in the newspapers. 
And uh, yeah, usually I'll look for an event and then I'll try to tie it to the address, at least in this book I did. In the next book, it's the story. So Mark Papp asks, or well says, John, this is fantastic. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. It's a remarkable collection of facts that paints a very interesting picture of our city. Kudos. My Thanks. question, did you at any point make a decision to become a master of hidden Chicago landmarks or was it a just, just, or was it a gradual unconscious process? Well, as I mentioned, it was gradual and unconscious and it does date back to when I bought that house in Oak Park in 1978. Well, we, we, our house was, you know, a frame house, a nice neighborhood, but not certainly not a rich neighborhood. And, um, down the block was this big mansion, obviously the best looking house on the block with the, with the brick house, with the, with the tile roof and everything like that. And I wondered who lived there. And finally, I happened to ask somebody after I'd been there about six months and they told me the Sam Giancana story. And then little things would pop up like that. Uh, uh, various things in the book. I, uh, one thing I didn't get to the uh, end of the book, uh, which I couldn't fit in was I tried to find out where Amelia Earhart lived when she was in Chicago. Because the thing about Amelia Earhart, she went to Hyde Park High School, but she didn't live in the district. Okay, she, she didn't live near Hyde Park High School. She actually lived somewhere else on the further south side and she didn't like the, or the schools that it would be sending her to. She very, at, at 15 years old, she's very decisive uh, even then. And so they faked her address and she got into Hyde Park High School. And I finally was able to trace down where she'd actually lived in Chicago and got an address. But by that time, the book was already published. And anyway, the house had been torn down. So <laughs> she did live on, uh, I think it was on Longwood Drive. I got the address somewhere, but it was further south in Beverly. Wow. Marsha Whitney Shank um, asks, were you born and raised in Chicago? Oh yeah. Yeah, I was born on the um, west side of Chicago, Loretta Hospital. And I grew up in Portage Park. And um, my mother actually lived in that same house for 80 something years, bungalow in the Portage Park neighborhood. So by the way, and then in, in this book, of course, being a dedicated citizen of Portage Park, I did an article of Portage Park as one of the drive-by neighborhoods. And I had a little picture of uh, the block where I grew up. So yeah, a uh, sixth generation, a uh, fifth generation rather Chicago, and uh, at least on one side of the family go back to people escaped from uh, from Germany in the revolutions of the 1840s. And supposedly we also had uh, an answer that have fought in the civil war for the good guys for the union. But uh, that's my background. Um, Kevin C asks, hi, wonderful storyteller. Would you have any history stories on Hawthorne racetrack? Uh, the, the only history story I can give you on Hawthorne racetrack is that where I live in Park Ridge, uh, the man across the street is actually a member of the family that owned Hawthorne Racetrack at one time. Okay. So it's the only story I can think of. I also dated a girl from uh, Cicero <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And, and uh, that was a couple blocks away and I'd get finished on a date. And if we come home early, I'd walk over and a friend of mine used to go out to the race, a friend of mine, Frank Russo, used to go out to the racetrack with his dad. His dad was a big, uh, big racetrack fan and he'd be over at Hawthorne or sports, sportsmen uh, watching, the, watching the ponies run and you know, say hello to Frank and everything like that. But yeah, that's, that's my Hawthorne racetrack story, not a personal story, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot you can find on that. I, that's not, that's probably not obscure enough. Marsha, Marsha asks also, um, have you included Dorothy Day in your books? Dorothy Day. Uh, remind me who Dorothy Day is. I, Marsha's going to have to, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Let's, let's move to. Um, you're talking about the, you're talking about the Catholic activist, Dorothy? I don't know. She'll have to. She'll yeah, have to answer yeah. that. Um, By the way, it was the Carey family I was talking about that that uh, that uh, lives across the street from me that owned Hawthorne. And uh, oh, one of the things I can tell you about the 
that connects to Hawthorne. For a while, they owned the only ski resort that was ever built in Chicago. This was Thunder Mountain. And I did, uh, that wasn't in the book, but the, they actually built a uh, ski resort for a few years on their old land at uh, Diversity and uh, Narragansett. It was a brickyard and the Cary Brickyard. And they opened it and they did skiing. They had skiing there for a while, but it didn't last. And of course, the shopping center later opened called the Brickyard. But that was Thunder Mountain. And it, it, when I was on the radio, I did a story about that, but that one didn't make it into the book. <laughs> for, for Marcia me. said yes, that um, I guess yes to the Catholic organizer of the Catholic oh. Workers Movement. Yeah, no, I didn't have anything on Dorothy Day on the book. Uh, but as okay. I said, who she is, and I know her relation, well, a relationship to our Catholic Church. So, yeah. We have another, um, I'm get, we're going to have time for, I think, like a couple more questions. Um, where is the Christmas Story House in Hammond? The Christmas Story House in Hammond, if I can find the address very quickly, it's at 3159 West 11th Street. Oh, and no, no, take that, scratch that, that's the house in Cleveland. It's at 2907 Cleveland Street. 2907 Cleveland Street, it's just off Kennedy Avenue, but please don't bother the people. They don't, uh, they don't like tourists. <laughs> and I, I, I agree with them. You respect the people who live there. 2907 uh, West Cleveland Street in Hammond. Um, Suzanne Smel Smeltzer, um, is asking the devil in white city by eric larson is about chicago's world's fair and murder did you consider including some of that information in your study no actually i didn't because that story is so well known after eric larson's book i don't think i could add anything to it i'm certainly going to improve on it so that, that is a marvelous book that is a marvelous yeah. um joan flanagan oh <laughs> of course joan would have this information um, Joan says Dorothy Day was baptized and confirmed at the Church of Our Savior, 530 West Fullerton, Lincoln Park. So, okay. so there. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of add, um, and then we'll wrap up, is um, Charles Dawes was actually a very prominent member of the Union League Club. Um, he, he actually lived here for a while um, when at, at the club. Um, when he was um, when he was in Chicago, so um, the there is a story that he wrote the the song here. Um, I have no proof of that, but um, he he was a, a very prominent member here at the club. Well, you see, I wrote the book before I was joined the club, so if I would have known that, I would actually get the club a plug. <laughs> That's good to hear. That's good to hear. And if they ever put in a second printing of the book, which they probably won't, but if they ever do, I'll include that. Right. Well, John, I want to thank you very much. This has been this has been a lot of fun, and um, uh, there's there's just a lot of of really quirky, interesting stuff in your book. And thank you very much. Um, like I said, it can be purchased at. Um, the bookseller in Lincoln Lincoln Square, or um, I urge you to use any independent bookseller if you're going to be buying his book. And I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you to Caxton Club members for coming as well. And um, we'll say good night. Well, good night. Thanks, for Thanks John. Thank you.